Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I'm Hunter O'Haney, I'm the director of the Stonewall National Museum and Archive here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and very happy to have all of you here and very happy to have our guest with us this evening, Dr. Nikki Green. Hello, Nikki, how are you? Hi, I'm well. Thank you for inviting me for this conversation. Thank you, Nikki. It's nice to see you. Nikki and I worked together a little bit when I was at CAA, and so we got to know each other a little bit there. And uh, speaking of which, did you go to the CAA conference last week? Did we I did. I moder I moderated one panel on liquid blackness, and you know it was a little bit more challenging. I'm used to the you know a big highlight of of conferences is seeing people you don't normally see. Sure. So I did a you know a couple of virtual events of you know, virtual wine nights, so <laughs> That's that <nice>. worked out. <laughs> well, tonight we're gonna to be talking about John Singer Sargent uh, and his model, Thomas McKellar. Uh, but just to tell those of you uh, who don't know anything about Stonewall, about us, Stonewall National Museum of Ar and Archives is located here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, we have one of the largest LGBTQ libraries in the world with 28,000 volumes. And in our archive, uh, we have 2,700 feet of materials. And so if you think about that for a moment, 2,700 linear feet takes you all the way up to the top of the Empire State Building and all the way back down. And it's estimated there are about 6 million pages of LGBTQ history, uh, primarily from um, about 1950 to the present day. And there are serials, there are, uh, there are um, files that, that we have collected ourselves, there are individual organization files, individual files as well too. And so it's a big resource uh, for those of you who are interested in queer studies, uh, or also anyone who's interested in American culture um, in the 20th century and 21st century, because it, it reflects the major thing of uh, obviously of what happened in the US. And so we continue to collect today. Um, in addition, uh, we do exhibitions um, at Stonewall. Right now we have uh, two shows up, one called Off Our Backs, which is looking at early lesbian publications from 1950 through 2000. And uh, that was curated by guest curator Megan Kent. And that will be on view through uh, April. And then last week we opened an exhibition called The Saint, which was, uh, that exhibition was based upon a historic nightclub in the Lower East Side in New York. Um, which really is just an amazing tale of a huge attraction for gay men in this nightclub. And then after the first year that it opened, the AIDS epidemic hit. And so it's an amazing story of how that affected so many people. That exhibition has original posters from, uh, from the Saint. And so we're very happy to, to have that as well too. So both of those exhibitions will be available through our website at stonewall-museum.org. Uh, there'll be virtual exhibitions, and we also have, uh, uh, we've, we've taped curated talks uh, for both of those, so you can see those on the website. And um, this series, we started in the beginning of the pandemic. Um, uh, Esther Newton was the first person we had probably 40 uh, episodes ago, and so we speak to somebody every week. Um, and uh, tonight's uh, program, like all these, are being recorded. Um, both on through Zoom and uh, which is re recorded and preserved on YouTube. And also we're on Facebook Live as well too. Hello everybody out there on Facebook, nice to see you. So if you have friends who are interested uh, in seeing tonight's talk, um, they can always uh, check it out on our website. All of our past talks are archived there as well. And I just wanna do a shout out to my colleague, Emery Grant, who is behind the scenes there, making sure this is all happening. Hello Emery, nice to see you. Hello, hello, and thank you. And uh, happy to have you. And so let's get down to business, Nikki. So um, just sure. to let people know um, a little bit about you. Uh, you are a tenured professor of art history at, at Wellesley College and an advisor to the ICA in Boston for the 25th Venice Biennale, presenting the work of Simone Lee for the US uh, Pavilion. You've written for numerous art museums, uh, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Guggenheim, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, and you have also co-produced a 2001 short art film, When We Gather, and was co-producer uh, and host of an online special broadcast, When We Gather Together. Your forthcoming book, uh, Grime, Glitter, and Glass, The Body um, and the Sonic in the Contemporary Black Art, uh, will be coming out this year from Duke University Press. Yes, and, hopefully, um, or early next year. Early next year, okay. Yeah. Are you done with your part? Mostly. <laughs> it's right to you know right to reproductions. I'm I'm I have a lot of images I want to include, so I'm at the end of that. 
Yeah. Well, don't forget about the doctrine of fair use. You know, there's always that. So. Yes. Thank you, CAA. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. So, um, Nikki, let's talk a little bit about uh, Thomas McKellar and John Singer's sergeant. Um, sure. Where do we start? From the beginning, I guess. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I think the best place to start is to maybe talk a little bit about how they met. Yeah. Um, well, Von Dome, huh? Yes. Right yeah. in, you know, right in the heart of Boston. Right. And when they met, he was an elevator, um, elevator operator. And he, John Singer Sargent, noticed him. Mm. And um, it was the place he you know, that sergeant visited all the time. Sergeant, of course, as the elevator operator is sort of a constant figure, a constant presence, right? And what's interesting about him being noticed as an art, as an artist looking at his physique is that he was a contortionist. Mm. And so the fact that sergeant could pick up as someone who was very keen on observing the body and understanding even I imagine as he stood in a uniform that hmm, this is different he, he there's must have been something about him that caught his eye and um and from there being invited to his studio and of course being an elevator operator at that time was a very good job for an African-American man who'd migrated north in order to pursue jobs that were um, certainly beginning to rise. Um, and what's also curious is that in the video, um, in, as part of the research by the Gardner, it was a great team of folks who um, worked on this exhibition. It was curated by Nathaniel Silver um, and there were great research um, folks on staff there too. I apologize, I don't remember everyone's names. Um, but what was fascinating is that they were able to, because they were able to find his, um, a record of his death and the funeral proceedings, they were able to find his descendants, Thomas McKellar's descendants. And what was surprising about, um, at least for me, and once they did contact the one of a sort of a distant niece or um, a niece and a, another niece by marriage, that um, there was a comment made that's in the recording uh, video for the museum and uh, that one of the niece says, you know, I'm glad he was able to leave um, North Carolina because, you know, there essentially seemed to have been some family understanding that he was gay and that that might have been one of the main motivations for him leaving the South. Well, of course, there were many people leaving, many Black people leaving the South at the same time. So I can imagine if that is part of, you know, separately from what we know of the um, not for sure, for sure, certain information about what sergeants, um, how sergeant was attracted, whether he was attracted to men and whether he had a relationship with men, that that element kind of brings us to making some conjectures. Sure. But, um, and he also left right after uh, um, the, the, there was a rebellion, there was a riot that took place in, in where he grew up and a race riot. Mm -hmm. And so also being motivated to find a new space to be and a new space to really um, become an independent man with a certain amount of gifts that he could use um, yeah well. it's interesting it's interesting too thinking although many people did I, I know but the idea that somebody looking for some degree of civil rights would go to boston um you know mm. because of some of the reputation that it had but you know also it had at the time too because of the role that others played in the Underground Railroad and, uh, and other places and Harriet Tubman, of course, that Boston was considered sanctuary for, for many people. But Absolutely. so going back to when to when McKellar and Sergeant met, I mean, they, according to my, my notes, they probably met around 19, um, 1916. Yes. And, and there was, I think, um, McKellar was 26 at the time and Sergeant was 60. 
So first of all, there's this big age difference between. Of course, two. yes. And and in a career standpoint. Sargent was pretty well established by that time, I would yeah. imagine. He was doing a lot of portraits of, of major social figures um, mm -hmm. in New York and Paris and London, mm -hmm. Austin. He was, he, I mean, he was surrounded by um, a very elite um, uh, group of individuals. Absolutely. He was the painter of Boston, right? He was someone who was um, the star of the show in terms of the arts, right? Um, and I think his ability to secure those mural, that mural commission at the MFA was part of the stature that he held there, mm -hmm. right? He had done it also, he was commissioned to do murals at the Boston Library, Boston Public Library. Um, he'd done murals also at, um, at on Harvard's campus um, in their library, right? So he was he was prolific by that time, and I think that's what's also really impressive that here he's spent a lifetime. I had had sort of he's toward the end of his career, what became toward the end of his career, and he spots new talent, mm. right? In in McKellar and. Um, and Boston certainly, and I think for me, the real attraction to this story, besides the unveiling of um, this model, not that people knew about Thomas McKellar, I should say. It wasn't that no one knew of his existence. There are letters that there's correspondences. Um, Trevor Fairbrother has done a, a lot of work in that respect. And um, so people knew about him. Um, Isabel Stewart Gardner knew him as well as, as one of um, Sargent's close associates. But what I really wanted to highlight about McKellar in the context of the exhibition, Boston's Apollo, was what, what was the environment like for him mm -hmm. as a Bostonian, as a Black Bostonian? And I typically am very attracted to um, the wherever I'm wherever I land to understand the geography of the place to understand the cultural moment of the time and um, I've been in the Boston area almost 10 years now and um, and it's certainly a different kind of place still than a New York or Chicago right and so it was nice to be able to dig into an early 20th century story of Black Boston from a completely different angle. Um, yeah, no, that's that's really important. Of course, it's really it's key to understanding and, and how various neighborhoods grew up and developed at that time and, and how areas. Um, yeah, we have um, we have a question here, and for folks, uh, we will be taking questions. Uh, we'll go through them, but just keep on throwing your questions into the chat here, um, mm -hmm. and we will be bringing those up. Um, and so, um, so here we have here we have Sergeant who is sixty years old. He meets um, a man who is uh, 26, uh, an elevator operator, clearly from mm -hmm. different races and different classes. Yes. Um, and as you say, Trevor Fairbrother certainly has done a lot of work about um, uncovering Sargent's uh, sexual orientation. And even though there's no direct evidence of it per se, as, as far as I understand it, the general mm -hmm. understanding is that uh, Sargent probably was gay. Right. And I think that's the best that we can say. That's the best that we can say. Yeah. Um, and of course, we have to remember this is a time uh, when Sargent was alive that um, it was not acceptable to, to be gay in any way, shape, or form. And right. so there were many people of that time that, you know, they had a fair amount of prestige, as, Sar as Sargent certainly did. And they, yeah. were, they left uh, instructions in their wills that you know mm -hmm. things would be destroyed or they would destroy them themselves because they didn't want to bring shame on their fit family and they, right. they simply didn't want the people to know mm -hmm. where they were coming from and so sergeant probably does fall within uh, that category i agree yeah. yes so the two of them met and then and and so then they strike up this friendship which of course You've got the, the class thing, which is different between them. You've got the race yeah. thing, which is different. You've got the access thing, which is different. Yes. But then in reading some of the stuff um, in your article um, and about the idea and, and some of the other things I've read where, where Sergeant 
the way it worked at the time is that if there were a commissioned portrait, the artist would make the schedule for the subject to sit down because they were paying for it to happen. But if it was a model, yeah. the artist would uh, just use the model like they were using some other tool. Yeah. But with but with McKellar, he he would make he would carve his day around being able to get um, McKellar as his model. So clearly, there was something going on. There was some attraction between the two, two of them. Yes, and also for McKellar, he's not. This is his side gig. Right, he McKellar later becomes a, a postal worker. Um, he was as an elevator um, elevator operator. It's a solid, really a solid middle class job to land, mm -hmm. and so he worked around his schedule. And of course, when he's talking with um, others and he wants to secure McKellar, he say he says things like, "I need him." <laughs> Um, he's not, you know, he, I need this man, I need Thomas to, to be the model. And he bases, he based all of the murals, most of the figures you see in the famous MFA murals are based on his physique, are based on his settings. And, and my understanding is he used him for, not just for the male figures, he used them for the female. Male, yes, for male and female figures. Right. And, um, and I think that's what's also really important. He has a major, major commission. This is the largest mural installation he's been asked to do. And his best model is Thomas McKellar. Yeah. Part of that did have to do with the fact that he was a contortionist. And we, I know we were trying to find some record of, um, of a performance or something. We didn't, we weren't able to secure that, but there's certainly evidence from, from McKellar that that was part of his, you know, that was his job. That was another one of his side gigs. And, and that's really hard to come by someone who expertly, someone who is, is able to really, I imagine, hold awkward positions. Yeah. And so I could see on that basis alone why McKellar would have been so good for a sergeant who to to execute this a number of paintings for over years yeah. right um, he winds up being his model for almost 10 years which is a very long time to right. hire someone yeah and he uh and it wasn't just the commission that he had at the mfa as you mentioned it was it was a commission that Sargent had for the Boston Public Library, as well as yes. the Widener Library at Harvard. And of yes. course, this was a big building boom time, both in New York and in Boston, in which it was sort of the golden age where there were um, sort of the Brahmins were building this cultural, yes. um, uh, this cultural infrastructure. And there right. were like palaces to put culture that were being built. And it's interesting too, let's, let's talk a little bit about um, Isabella Stewart Gardner, because of course we're going to talk about the exhibition being there at the Gardner M Museum, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but also about these drawings. And so just to put this in some kind of context, for those of you who are not familiar, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is in Boston. Um, Mrs. Gardner um, purchased all of this work during her lifetime, and then when she passed away, it's all in this uh, in these two palazzos uh, on the Fenway in Boston, and there's a lovely Renzo Piano edition to it as well too but part of her will is that all the pieces have to stay where she left them and so it's sort of an amazing phenomenon from a museum standpoint but she was a huge collector of work and so and so she has sergeants in the collection certainly she would have known him but what's interesting about the exhibition that that you wrote about that was um at the Gardner Museum I guess last fall um, yes. last yeah fall. yeah close in the fall yeah, and it was crazy because of COVID, not as yeah. many people got to see it. There's a great catalog, by the way, and you can uh, you can order it online at the Gardner Museum if you're interested. Uh, there's some great essays, including one by Nikki in there as well, too. Yeah. Uh, and um, but so and so my so the exhibition in part was based upon some of the drawings that yes. some had felt were unfinished, but drawings of of uh, Mc, of um, McKellar that Sargent had done that he personally had given. To Mrs. Gardner, apparently yes. signed, and signed, and they were just sitting in a drawer um, yeah. uh, for for many years. 
Yeah. So do we suppose that that within the Boston culture world at that time, that somebody like Mrs. Gardner or other, you know, bon vivants and raconteurs and the sort of the upper class, that they would know that Sargent was gay, but it wouldn't be discussed? Uh, do we assume that that was probably what was going on? I believe so. I think that it was an open secret. Yeah. Right. You didn't, it wasn't polite to talk about it, right? That um, there was an understanding that Sargent as a bachelor yeah. um, for all of his life, that there, yeah, there's there's kind of a a, a, a secret code about that. And um, and with the understanding that, you know, it, it's okay, he's a great artist. Right. And so let's focus on the fact that he is a prominent artist. And um, and I would love to show some images because I think what's really interesting about about his his working with McKellar is that he eventually creates a um, a painting that was held in in, in his uh, his studio that only it was really on view for those who had permission who were invited to come into that space to see what really is in my opinion I would love to hear from other people when you see this uh, painting if you've read the New York Times article it's it's posted there as well but it was pretty scandalous yeah I mean, this is not an ordinary painting let's but, take a look at it do you have yeah. do you have a queued up hold on just a second get the full view here. Yes. Just while we're getting this queued up, there was a question here about, is there any evidence about a relationship between the two? And the only thing that I could find, and I certainly did not research this, mm -hmm. but that is a letter from Sargent, I, I apologize, I don't remember it to whom it's written, but mm -hmm. he wrote in the letter, quote, I don't know what I shall do without him. Yes. And uh, that can be taken a number of ways. Um, of course, Wait, hold on, I'm sorry about that. Let me just make sure this is full view. Can you see the screen now? Oh yeah, looks great. Okay, um, give me just a second. You know, it's interesting that actual that exchange had to do with um, having him sit for him. So it's not it's not, you know, it's not an innuendo towards, you know, I've got to have him in my presence per se, yep. but more so he is really his first choice always. Yep. And um, I think that that kind of determination to only use him as the idealized form was really quite strong for him. Yep. Um, let me just make sure I have this in, hold on, full screen. <clears throat> so I should say too that, you know, in, so this is the only painting of McKellar as McKellar as Thomas McKellar, where he is brown, where you see that he is, he's I, clearly identified as a black man. And of course you have him spread akimbo. And that really is the signal for me of, okay, this, this is definitely a different perspective. Mm -hmm. Thomas McKellar was not the only black male that he painted. He did paint a series of um, of paintings of black men in the Bahamas, I believe, yep. in the Caribbean, but it's more, it's not, it's not direct. It's not this kind of frontal view. It's, it's a reclining on rocks and on the beach and in the sand. Um, and they, they were water, water, um, color. And so with this one painting that really you can tell is not finished, not quite finished. You can tell here that there are some wings um, and an, a silhouette, almost as if he started something and changed his mind. It could have been a study for the, the murals, but he eventually lands with this sort of, and you can see the kind of strong outlines of his figure. 
to to hold as his own. He displayed this on the walls of his um, of his studio. And again, if you walk in and see something, this is not something you can find at the MFA. Right. Right. Um, and it's clearly, and you can see, this is where I say, this is a contortionist body at work to be able to hold this particular pose. He must have held it for a very long time and repeatedly. Um, and you can see where his knee is awkwardly placed on a pillow and he's kind of back this way. Um, and, and he looks off almost as a heavenly gaze. Um, one might even say, again, depending on how you read it, I, I think it's also a kind of very um, enraptured look that could be looked at as a, a kind of godly, uh, or if one were to go there, maybe this kind of sort of arousal, a, a, a kind of erotic look upwards as he displays himself for the painter. I mean, the face, the face is just so angelic and so beautiful in this face. And of course, with the body as well, too, in the way that it, it says so many things that, you know, the idea of the eroticism from this and, you know, it gets to that big question about, you know, what makes work, work gay or, or erotic. But, you know, I was, reading, I was reading the, um, the piece that Holland Cotter wrote in the Times and where he comes straight out and says, it's a homoerotic piece of, of work. Mm -hmm. Of course, I think that those kind of things are really in the eye of the beholder. Agreed. Uh, uh, and so, but, but I think that many people would look at this and to say there is a degree of desire, you know, that there, if, if there is such a thing as a gay male gaze in work, you know, you, you got to say there's something going on here. Absolutely. And so where I, so we don't have, we don't have love, love letters between them. We only have really Sergeant's voice, his earnestness for him to pose, his um, sort of his affection for him as a model in a mm -hmm. professional sense. I wanted to, when I looked at these paintings and I should go back, I, I was introduced to these paintings by Nathaniel Silver discovered it in the drawer, right? Um, hadn't been on display for the hundred years that they've been in, in the home, in the museum. And when I looked at the drawings, um, I was struck by, and here is, I should mention on the left is an example of the drawings as part of that portfolio. And this is actually one of the sketches from the MFA mm -hmm. and, um, what I became intrigued by, and this happened really um, pretty late after my first view of it, I was really, um, I was impressed by, of course, I mean, these gorgeous paintings of this beautiful man um, who, when you look at them in the context of the full portfolio, you, he's identifiably Black, phenotypically what we would call phenotypically black. So of course, with the shading, you can see that. I went back, I knew I had to write the essay, you know, when that deadline's breathing, I said, let me go look one more time. And so I come, I, they, they're put out in the conservation room for me to see. And I, I'd always, I'd witnessed, so this is me, I just take a quick picture. I'm like, hmm, I take a step back, I come back and I went, this is really bothering me. Mm. What is going on with his chest? I don't get it. What this looks like a mistake, but these are finished. He doesn't really make a mistake, right? And I went, that is really odd. So um, I remember pausing. Nathaniel Nat Silver was in the room, and I said, "Has anyone ever noticed um, his nipple?" <laughs> <laughs> which for me as, I mean, I'm an Americanist, I'm an Africanist, but I have never had to say nipple in, a, in an essay. <laughs> right. So many times, so many times. So I said, something's like, what's going on with his nipple? And then I said, oh, wait, let me go back to the painting. Um, I don't know if I have it in order. So I go back to the painting. I literally went to the catalog of the MFA's murals catalog. And I went, 
wait a minute, what's up here? In the painting, this nipple is just a little bit askew. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started to look at more of the drawings and I'd look at, um, I even that day went, walked over to the MFA, which is right down the street. And I said, I wonder if this shows up in the murals. This just is really, um, this is different. Like every single, not every, well, I should mention, it's not every single painting, it's not every single drawing, but it comes up enough for me to notice mm. that there's just a slight difference here. Um, and so I realized, okay, this might be an issue of there being a keloid. Maybe Thomas McKellar had a keloid. Mm. Now that is a tell for me. So I, I because I realized, well, who has access to his body? Right. It's McKellar. I mean, it's Sargent. Right. This is intimate. Right. This is no longer just any model. It's no longer just any figure who is who is reclining for him. This is a, these are tells about this particular man. Um, and then when I got, I, this is literally when I, I go over to the MFA that afternoon, this is in, in May before the um, catalog is due. And I start really thinking about each of these paintings where the bodies show up. And I don't know if I have the sketch of that. Um, I don't have it here, but I thought this was peculiar and it comes up this particular painting comes up in the review of the murals in the Boston, um, the Boston, what's the Boston paper called? Oh, the Boston Globe or the Boston the Globe. Globe. Okay. In the, it comes up in the Globe as this, this is an anomaly. Hmm. Um, and someone says, I don't really understand why it's there. Hmm of all, because so many of them are these, you know, classical figures. You have him as, as, the, as the Apollo, he's, he's shown as Apollo. So then I, I look back at this and I said, oh, well, yeah, this makes sense. This is McKellar. Hmm. Because for the time, early 20th century, Egypt stood in for the continent of Africa. It was used in a lot of Harlem Renaissance poetry. This is, you know, so this is actually, I think, another coded message mm -hmm. for McKellar. Egypt, the Sphinx, um, the pyramids, those all signaled Black identity, Black civilization. Right. So if we take this then as McKellar, then what we have here, I argue, is another, possibly another intimate signal of the relationship between Sargent and McKellar. It is a guess based on the visual evidence, because to me, to depict someone's, you know, to, to pick a male nude, is certainly not as seductive for the general audience as a female body, right? Because we're, we understand breasts historically as you know being much more erotic for a hetero, um, uh, a heterosexual audience. And yet, for McKellar, because he may have had this this keloid that only Sargent would know about to repeatedly place it inside of the murals, to place it inside of the drawings, the complete drawings he gives to um, Gardner, and then to include this, what is noticed at the opening, kind of an odd painting that didn't really belong with the rest of the program. It's yet, an, at least to me, it's another coded message. And, um, and of course, I would argue a very similar looking up in ecstasy, but this time in this near kiss between the two.
figures. Yeah, and also I can't, I, I mean, see, I've never seen these two side by side like this. It's so great to be able to see them like this. Mm -hmm. But I mean, now, I mean, can't you see McKellar's face in the Sphinx there? Well, <laughs> you know, and of course this goes again, back to some of the stuff, which is so fascinating. Given, get, given sort of the, the class things and the, and, and the race things that were going on at the time, how, how um, and going back to, to the portrait of McKellar, mm -hmm. where, where a Sergeant actually wanted to normalize him. He wanted yes. his blackness to be accepted. And, and, and he, it, it, I mean, now looking at this, he's, it looks like he was trying to idolize him in a way that, that um, probably had a lot of attachment. He's giving him power. He's giving, he's giving this model power. He's giving him a certain amount of secretive power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it's secretive. It's but, but so it's him, not he, really empowering if you don't know that right. that's McKellar. I, I totally get it. But in his mind, in his mind, in, in his in, mind, yes. As a as a white male in Boston. Yes. Yeah. Yes. He's putting him on a pedestal, even if it's in his own own mind. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that so my essay i call it surateur under erasure because we are meant to understand i should back up here we are meant to understand the bodies that are occupied within these murals are in fact mckeller but only if you're in that inner circle yeah. if you're a gardener you know that's you know that that's thomas mckeller Right. right. If you are one of the many people, um, Brahmins in Boston, who visited, who may have talked about McKellar, perhaps Sargent is talking about these sittings, maybe in private, he is discussing just how wonderful he is, just how adept he is. Mm -hmm. But when that, when, you know, when the doors open and you see, you look up at the, the mural series, you know, you're not thinking, oh, that's a black man, <laughs> right? <laughs> of course, no, they are all classical Greek mythological figures yeah. that are to be read as, you know, white, um, idealized white male and female bodies. Yeah, and that goes to the theory of sort of the uh, race uh, er erasure that you were speaking about. Yeah, exactly. So tell us a little bit more about that. So I have often used Franz Fanon, um, the Martinican um, psychiatrist who was well known for his post-colonial writings on how blackness, how black people under the colonial gaze show up. Mm -hmm. So in Black Skin, White Masks, he is very explicit about what does it mean to be a, a, a black Martinican man who shows up in the streets of Paris, who shows up on a subway in Paris and a little boy cries and says, that's an N-word, right? Look at that man, and he's frightened, right? And so Fanon discusses just how much of the psychological work that has to take place to be your own person, to know yourself and your culture as a man growing up in Martinique, as well as a scholar and very well-known professional in France, um, who is othered. And so with that, alongside, of course, W.E.B. Du Bois's understanding of the double consciousness of a Black man, that the, under, sort of his premonition of the 20th century, that the problem um, and the number one problem in America will be the problem of the color line. Mm -hmm. And that black, black Americans will constantly have to wear a veil where they can see out to the world, but the world doesn't clearly see who they are. And they kind of have to balance the black and white worlds together. So combined with Fanon's sort of post-colonial read on black identity with Du Bois, I've always been fascinated by how does black identity show up in art? How does it show up certainly by 
artists of African descent, um, be it from the Caribbean or the United States, but also by the hands of white artists. How, how then do they interpret a black identity as it shows up? And so this is what's really intriguing about Sargent is that in private, as someone who got to know him over, it's again, it can't stress enough, it's unusual to keep a model for nearly 10 years. But to use his body, to see him as the ideal, mm -hmm. he, I must have Thomas McKellar. Right. He, it, he loans him out to mm. another artist to pose for a statue. I apologize, I don't remember the particular um, the particular person, but he stands in for an indigenous person. And there's a great um, model of his body as an indigenous man, right? There's a lot of masking that happens. And so to me, I've always been fascinated every time I've been to the MFA, once I had discovered that, okay, Boston's Apollo, which is really the, has typically been the highlight of of showing the portrait. And I should say, um, give me just a minute here because I do not have my um, slides marked. I don't remember which um, slide it is, but the, the way in which the MFA had typically um, installed this painting was in what's, um, there's more, a more official gallery name for it, but the Sergeant Room. So anyone who has been to the MFA, you walk into I believe, the second floor um, or the third floor of the American Wing. You walk into the Sergeant Room, you see the, um, the Boyd sisters, the daughters. Um, that's one of the highlights of the collection. And they have for years, alongside all of the white elite of Boston who are fully clothed in their finery, um, they would have this portrait in the same room with not much of an explanation, frankly, right? Oh, this is Thomas McKellar and he's the sitter for Boston's Apollo. If you wanna go all the way back and look at the murals in another building in the original building, right? Because the American wing is, is fairly new, as you mentioned. And I would always bring students and I say, let's look at this portrait. <laughs> He's the only black man here. Mm. And look at him. This is the only representation we have of a black man. This is before I knew who Thomas McKellar was and his story. This is the only representation we have of a black man being painted and he is not just naked, he is placed in the most vulnerable position possible. And I would always press my students to think about what does this placement mean? And what is the signal? What's the message that's being told? Which is why I love that this exhibition, Boston's Apollo at the, at the Isabella Stewart Garden Museum has broadened the context for a model like him who really was more than just the body, that he had a whole, you know, he had a whole history and he's not just on display in contrast to the Brahmins of, of Boston. And, and so I, I feel very passionate about that <laughs> um, because as, you know, as a professor, as someone who I feel very responsible for my students, sorry, for my not knowing where my slides are. Um, I feel very responsible for my students and giving them a, a, a fuller historical context for how artists work in any particular time. And I, I don't wanna overlook the fact that you have Boston, um, not many people know that outside of New York, the greatest number of members to the National Association of, for Colored People, the NAACP at the time was Boston. Mm -hmm. Boston, the Boston community, like many black communities throughout the country, boycotted Birth of a Nation. 
right? The premier racist um, film <laughs> nearly ever made. Like it's it's like this this actually the birth of a nation increases the activity of the KKK because it basically heralds the KKK, right. and um, and Boston was a, a real center for for that that um, backlash. Um, wanting to stop it. They weren't successful in stopping it altogether, but it's definitely slowed it down. Yeah. No, it's, it's really interesting because you're absolutely right. And of course, you know, the, the tide did change in Boston uh, after that time, but it was a safe, it was a safe haven for many people of color and, and it's great. And so we're looking at a slide here um, in Boston of members of the black community yes. actively and peacefully picketing um, uh, D.W. Griffith's The Birth of a Nation, which is really mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it just brings it all back. So let's talk a little bit more about, about McKellar in, in the fact, so as far as, as far as we know, he, um, he worked as, as, at the Vendome and, and then he went to have a successful career um, in the post office, as you yes. mentioned. Um, yes. Uh, Sergeant passed away in 25. Um, so, you know, McKellar was probably in his mid thirties at that time. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand from what I've read that he got married, um, when yes. he was about 40 yes. and had several kids. And, um, and as you were saying, some of his descendants, he I don't believe he had kids. I'm sorry. I don't think he had kids. Oh, is that right? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. No kids. Okay. Um, but he, but he has, uh, the descendants were nieces and nephews. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then he happily, apparently, he happily lived his life out, you know, until he passed away in the early 1960s. Yes. Um, and um, so what's, what was the relationship um, with his descendants and seeing the show and, and everything about his work? I think there was real excitement because mm. they weren't aware of the full history of, of him as a model. Yeah. This was all new for the family to understand that that was him. And there's a quote by Thomas McKellar when they when when they later um, interview him, where he says, um, "Atlas, this is my body." Mm -hmm. And I should probably I apologize. I don't have it readily. Let me just um, show you that tremendous portrait of him as Apollo or not, because <laughs> I don't know where I put it. Um, but nevertheless, he, he poses as, as um, he poses for the Apollo. And so the typical image of Apollo is with the world on his back. Oh yes, um, and he says that's him. Yeah, he said, this is my body, which I love. I love that it's sort of, um, it's, a, it's a declaration. But he didn't, I don't think during his time, he didn't understand just how pervasive, pervasive that mural was. I don't think he, I don't think he understood the magnitude of his presence within the murals. Mm. I mean, he, he knew he didn't share in the, um, he didn't share in the, in the treasures that came from that, right? Mm. Um, I forget the exact number that's that sergeant was paid but it was a handsome sum yeah and thomas mccaller had during this time he actually did have financial strain and and there are letters where he's going back and saying can you please pay me um you know i'm owed 20 dollars here right so while he's struggling to get you I apologize for that um while he's struggling to get literally coins <laughs> from Sargent. Sargent has benefited financially like tenfold. Sure. So. Of course. And allowing him to live, to live the life that he was living at the time. So we have a question here. Um, it sounds like this is certainly a different power dynamic for the time period. A white artist elevating a black man's body as ideal and classical in a period of terrible black caricatures. But how is this power dynamic still lopsided? When you mentioned how Sargent loaned his model, it reminded me of the inequity of the period and how black men were historically treated like objects. Can you speak about that a little bit more? Um, how is it still lopsided? Was that the question in terms of yeah. the power dynamic? Yeah, yes. 
You mean after the research has been done? I'm trying to, I can't actually see the um, question here without stopping my share. Um, um, so the question, the question is, um, a white artist elevating a black man's body as ideal and classical in a period yes. of terrible black caricatures. Mm -hmm. But how is this power dynamic still lopsided? When you mentioned how Sargent loaned his model, it reminded the, the uh, questioner of the um, inequality of the period and how right. black men were historically treated like objects. It's, you know, I, what the exhibition does and what our research did was try to even out the power dynamic. However, the original power dynamic still remains without, because I guess the, hmm, I hear what you're saying. And I'm, I'm actually gonna recall some of the, um, the comments of my students who got a chance to see the works behind the scenes, got to see the, the drawings before they were fully on display. I will actually, um, I like that, uh, the images of my students, <laughs> my Wellesley College students, they, they are brilliant and I learned from them as well. But, you know, in conversation, a lot of them, and especially after the exhibition was um, opened, they, they actually argued with, with some of, what they read, they read basically most of the uh, exhibition catalog um, <laughs> ahead of time. And they argued that because there's so much supposition about Michaela's relationship with Sargent um, and that we can't really know the way in which Michaela saw himself, which I tend to agree with, McKellar isn't really outside of that statement. This was my body. This is my body. Um, there's not a lot of McKellar's voice in this. Mm. So what the exhibition does is it creates a context by which we can support McKellar and his voice and, his, and, the, and again, broadening that out to the Boston community. Um, so I still see it as imbalanced because if for the time, Sargent never claimed him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's been, and I would, I would also say that, and this is not, um, I'm not gonna make any apologies for this, but I, as a black art historian, um, I was invested in this as a way to highlight those indifferences and perhaps move the needle towards less imbalance mm -hmm. um, and to change the minds, the, the mindsets and the way in which Boston audiences and anyone who goes into the MFA sees these bodies. So perhaps it is kind of evening things out, but as we see in um, art museums today, as museums grapple with institutional racism, you know, many, much of that dynamic is still in place. Oh, no question. It's right. It's, so this is like, I feel like this is one narrative, one story yep. that um, has been made available. And there's still so much work to do in that in that vein. So I, I'm kind of of two minds of it. I'm really proud of the research that I was able to do on this. And I should say I was not alone. I think one of the ways that the Gardner Museum really made a um, made an intervention to this point of power dynamics was that they created a community based um, working group mm. not in the way of let me have some folk of color and some people in the community come in for one meeting give us all the ideas and then go about your way right. rather they involved artists and historians and um, a theater director, the, the head of the edu of, of education, Catherine, ah, forget Catherine's last name. Um, they all made contributions. They had wall, they had their own interpretations and, you know, um, 
tidbits of their own words responding to the images. They were the ones who said, we need a, um, we need a chronological um, timeline of Boston history. Mm. So when you walked into the gallery space, you saw what, what was going on in Boston at the time, both in terms of the racial dynamics, but also historically, so that there was a full context available. And that doesn't, that kind of intervention doesn't come unless you are listening to the black community, unless you are really thinking about the residents of Roxbury, which is predominantly black and brown. You want, you want black and brown bodies, then include black and brown bodies at the table. Right. So a lot of, I think the power dynamics um, and I do, I, I tip my hat to the Gardner Museum for really making that investment and not having a one-off of, okay, we'll just, <laughs> we'll put this up because it took, um, it took a team of people to make this story available. Um, and I wish that McKellar, you know, we use this phrase, we need to give people their flowers while they're yeah. still alive. I wish he did get more of his flowers and yeah. his coin. I really wish he got paid more because sure it sure. remains a real big attraction for the MFA. Yeah, and there's no question about it. I mean, in the, you know, in the context of art history, I mean, we're talking about a major uh, American figure, 19th century American figure. And of course, so much of it um, is related to, to this. It's great seeing your students in these things. It's also w wonderful to hear you talk about uh, possibly even erasing the racial erasure and to, to bring some of these things yes. out in out in the open. And then of course, for, from our perspective, it's really nice to, to begin to look at with, to look at the idea of erasing um, anti-gayness or homophobia yes. out there at the same yes. time as well too. We're left with just a few crumbs of evidence about this. And of course, there are those of us who are in the business of looking at this and thinking about it and trying to be as honest as we can about what it is. But you know, you go back to that portrait and it's, it's, sort of, it's sort of tough not to say the maker of that portrait was not someone who, who felt very strongly and very passionate, uh, passionate about this individual. And, and again, it's not a one-off, Sergeant. Right. This, this, is, this, is, this is him, you know, him working to create something so incredibly beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely, um, and and there had to have been something that went on between the two, but we don't know. We don't know, and and I would even argue that some of what might be going on is a projection of desire. Yes, that's that, that's, that's, and that's, I think with that kiss, that kind of tension of the the wanting, the yeah. wanting to realize that, and and I think that is key for um, thinking about queerness during this time where you yeah. can't be out, Correct. you know, you can't, you can't express that. A absolutely right. right? And, and even if there was no physical, which, uh, you yeah. know, I think, I think your, your stuff about, uh, about the nipple is just hugely f fascinating that this is really a degree of intimacy, but, but even, even if there was no touching between the two, yes. for McKellar to have been there for 10 years, yes. he had to have known that there was something going on and that he was a participant in that relationship, even if there was nothing that was ha happening. Exactly. I 100% I, I agree with you. Yeah. And it comes out in the paintings, yeah, yeah. right? And it comes out, and I think in particular with this painting is it's almost, um, it's a keepsake. Yeah, yeah. It's his, I, you know, his lock of hair, and, you know, where you're kind of keeping it here, um, but it's still on display for those who come. And just for those, uh, just remind everybody this painting, um, Nikki, you said is on, regular display at the MFA in Boston? It in is. I'm not sure if it's on display right now. The MFA is open, but I'm not sure whether it's up in the galleries right now or whether they're going to reinstall it in the sergeant room because I, they haven't asked my opinion, but my opinion <laughs> is, <laughs> my opinion is, is that it should be closer to the murals. If they, if they insist on putting it out, I think that because it's such a public space, yeah. um, it, the murals really, lie at the intersection between the new wing and, um, and the, what's now the Benin Gallery um, African art 
galleries, I think that perhaps it's a little bit too much mm -hmm. to have yeah. where, you know, you have school groups coming through. I still think it belongs there or at least some mural adjacent. Yeah. yeah. Mural adjacent, because I think it's too out of context with the fully clothed um, white folk. Yeah, no, I'm with you and it's, it's great. Nikki Green, it's just been amazing to have you here. Great to chat with you. Um, Good to and, chat with you, Hunter. Oh my God, it's just so great. And uh, thank you for sharing this amazing story. Uh, the exhibition is, is not up any longer, but you can uh, go to the, um, you can go to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum website. Yes. You can get a copy of the catalog. Yes. We, have, we have a copy of course at the Stonewall Library. Um, and um, be sure to sign up for our newsletter at stonewall-museum.org. Um, and uh, next week, uh, Naomi Wolf will be here. And uh, so we do these shows um, every week. And so it's been great to, uh, to have you here with us, Nikki. And I hope if you're in Florida, you, if you come down to uh, Miami or Fort Lauderdale, you come say hi, because it would be it great. It is a must. Great. I, I promise. I promise to do just that. And when the world opens back up. Um, thank you for this. And thank you for the work that you're doing at the Stonewall. Thank you. Happy to do it. And so great. Good night, everybody. See you all next week. Thank you.